So welcome everyone. We're gonna start in just one minute. Welcome to uh, the seminar uh, series, the Health Law Seminar Series. This is the second seminar uh, in the series. Uh, welcome, to, uh, welcome to everyone. Um, I'm gonna introduce uh, our speaker in just one minute or perhaps Holly, while I uh, introduce, you can um, get the, the slides set up as we, mm -hmm. uh, as we work on this uh, technology. So I, if, if you uh, set it up to do the, the slideshow share um, before you share your screen, that's probably um, helpful. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay. okay. <laughs> so you play with that while I, um, while I introduce you. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, it's great uh, to have you here on this uh, Friday in October. Uh, my name is uh, Jennifer Llewellyn. I'm a professor here at the Schulich School of Law, and, uh, and I'm the director of the Restorative Research Innovation and Education Lab um, here at Schulich. Uh, so we just, we're just going to do a couple of tech things, and then I'll introduce uh, Holly. That's perfect. We can see them perfectly now, Holly. That's great. <laughs> so it is that. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this second uh, health loss seminar uh, in the series. Uh, just as a reminder, so you can uh, mark your calendars and I'll remind you again at the end, uh, the next uh, in the series uh, will be on October 29th and Ingrid uh, Waldron will be our speaker. But this morning, it's my pleasure to, uh, to be here and to be able to host this health loss seminar and to welcome uh, Dr. Holly Northam. Uh, to give us our seminar uh, this afternoon. Uh, Holly is the inaugural Distinguished International Visiting Fellow at the Restorative Research Innovation and Education Lab here at the Schulich School of Law. Uh, she brings over 30 years of clinical experience to her research and teaching practice, and she's currently a senior lecturer and the discipline lead for nursing at the Faculty of Health at the University of Canberra in Australia. Her research and work is shaped by a strong social justice focus that's underpinned by her professional identity as both a nurse and a midwife. Uh, Holly's approaches to her research are framed using the lens of both hope and a restorative approach to support and enable flourishing in health settings. And this is reflected in the two main arms of her research. Uh, the first has explored experiences of organ donation and transplantation, and the second is related to her engagement with the Collaborative Indigenous Research Initiative at the University of Canberra, where Holly and her team have received funding to identify restorative practices for the new University of Canberra Hospital. The ongoing relationship um, that has ensued between her research team, the Ngunnawal elders, uh, who are the traditional owners of the uh, Australian Capital Territory and the elders in Wanganui, New Zealand has been transformational and enabled cultural safety in healthcare. And she's gonna share some of that uh, work with us this morning. These ideas, of course, always circle back for Holly to the foundational role that early childhood plays in predicting future health. Holly is also an active member and leader within the Canberra Restorative Community, uh, which is part of the International Learning Community for a Restorative Approach uh, that's hosted here at the Restorative Lab at Schulich. Uh, she was the recipient in 2019 of the Medal of uh, the Order of Australia uh, for her work. So I know uh, Holly's been very disappointed that she isn't able to be here in person uh, uh, to take up her role uh, in residency as the international visitor, but uh, the world being what it is, uh, we, have, um, we have agreed to try to do this fellowship uh, virtually uh, and to ensure that there's a chance for it to be in person uh, one day. She is nonetheless really excited to make connections uh, in a virtual way with those within this thriving health and social justice community of scholars, researchers, and practitioners. And so really excited to have this opportunity of the health seminar um, to be able to share some of her ideas with you and hoping that will lead uh, to some contacts and connections uh, during her time as the fellow. Uh, she's coming to us from Canberra. It is currently 2 a.m. in the morning in Canberra on Saturday. 
So this is a clear sign of her interest and dedication to the work and excitement to be here with all of you and a clear evidence of the fortitude of nurses who spent much of their life working on the night shift. So she assures us this will be no problem. Um, so welcome Holly. Uh, we're, she, Holly's gonna present for about 40 minutes. During her presentation, if questions uh, come to you that you're interested in, please enter them in the question and answer uh, box at the, that you can locate at the bottom of your screen. I'll follow along with those and try to ensure uh, that I pose them with as much enthusiasm as you're asking them at the end of her presentation. Um, and, uh, and we really look forward to this opportunity uh, to hear from Holly and then to hear from you. So I'll turn it over uh, to you, Holly. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, look, uh, first off, before I get started, it's really important to me to acknowledge um, the Mi'kmaq people who are the unceded custodians and owners of the Mi'kmaqi where the Dalhousie University is located. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge that here in Canberra in Australia, the Ngunnawal people who have cared for our country here for over 60,000 years um, are the, the traditional custodians of our land where I'm located. And I'd like to thank them and their elders who give a safe um, passage across their lands. I'd also like to acknowledge any other Indigenous people who are part of the, the, um, the listening audience today and acknowledge each one of you for your ancestors and my ancestors and all our families who have brought us to this moment, our co-researchers and the people who provide us with the knowledge and wisdom that we build on. And my sincere thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today. My special thanks to, Dr., uh, to Professor Jennifer Luella, and um, who, are, who is extraordinary great generosity and knowledge and wisdom and trust to have me here today. And I'd like to send a special humor to um, Professor Deep Saini, the president of um, Dalhousie. He was our previous vice chancellor here at the University of Canberra and we miss him. So um, with the framing my work today that I'm going to be talking about, I'd like to take through a journey um, about the use of restorative approaches in my practice and how um, it, it's been a bit of a journey of exploration. So as Jen has previously mentioned, there are two arms to the research. There's the organ donation work, and then it's moved into a greater understanding of um, Indigenous peoples and the lives and impact of colonisation here in Australia. So this is where I come from. At the moment, I'm located just near the University of Canberra. And I'd like to start by talking about acknowledgement. We do acknowledgement at the beginning of, um, of, of any of our uh, uh, lectures and our meetings to say that that here, particularly where I'm located, this is, um, this is a country that's been invaded um, and there's much that we don't know about the past. In Australia, we've, we've hidden the past pretty effectively for the Australian population. And so um, people like um, Melissa Sweet, who did this thesis where she looked at um, the problems of medical incarceration um, of how we, um, we, we've actually created extraordinary harms to the First Nations in Australia over many, many years. And these harms continue with a, a, a significant gap in life expectancy between non-Indigenous and Indigenous Australians. So the work and the, the underpinnings of this talk today will be about, we have this past, we have this, uh, this uh, challenge in our healthcare system that, that is sitting there like, um, like a cancer. And I'm, what I'd like to share with you is the way that I'm trying to approach it as a, as, as a health professional but, uh, and as a researcher, but also as a person. This is lifelong work when we do restorative work. So um, this is um, my uh, wonderful colleagues at the University of Canberra. We all came together for Reconciliation Day and we, we all made a stand to call for, um, for action against black, uh, about deaths in custody and the importance um, of saving black lives um, who have been quite seriously impacted by um, 
by our institutional racism and violence. So got a great team and as non-Indigenous people, we work very hard to stand by and to stand up for um, and recognise injustice when we see it. And as a nurse and a midwife, this is a critical part of a role of, of, of for, forming a relationship with a community which is, um, which is honest and trusting and um, respectful. So where we started from um, is quite a few years ago, I started doing a PhD on and looking at the experience of families um, when they were faced with organ donation decisions. So this, when we think about that in the intensive care units of hospitals, um, we know that this is a challenging area of experience for many people. And there's a lot of assumptions in the healthcare system about why people make decisions and how those decisions are made and how it works. And the general people who report on those decisions are the doctors and nurses who are witness to uh, the decision-making process. So my PhD actually explored what it was like for families to make the decisions and what happened for those families in the decisions. And it became clear after chatting um, at length and with, with great respect and listening to nine families that, that it was a complicated situation for people as they, they passage through the healthcare system. This little com complicated screen is sharing a little bit about what it was like for families. So, so we sort of in a hospital, we often think, oh, you know, we have we're planned, we have, we have processes and we have events that happen and we, we are in control of the situation. Families come in, they've had a crisis event and they're suddenly caught up um, in the way that hospitals work. And so information might not be clear. Um, suddenly they happen to do things that they're not expecting to have to do and they're wanting to fit in, they're wanting to conform. They don't, they don't want to rock the boat because they are feeling very vulnerable. There's a change in the power structures. They lose power and for their relative who might be dying, um, that the power is completely lost. So for, for families, and, and this is, I'll only touch on this briefly because this is a, I, I want to talk about other things, but the, the families go into it, what seems to them like a fog, like they're drowning, they're trying to find information, they're trying to, to work out what's happening. They ma manage to, to struggle through trying to, to fit in to the, to the way we run the healthcare system, to the way we run hospitals. For them, time stands still. They might be left outside in the waiting room and told, look, somebody will be back in a few minutes to see you, but that time might tick on for hours. That time might be about wishing that they, they hadn't spent that last five minutes um, with their loved one doing the things that they'd done rather than spending that time telling them they love them. There's all these things that happen with the time and stopping the clocks. And within that, that period, then they go through a, a stage where they're wanting to find that their, tr their, their trust is protected, that the healthcare system is looking after them. There, be, there are many themes around hope that emerge, um, hope, hope that things will get better, hope that there's not suffering, hope for um, a, good, a, a good outcome. And then there's the reality of being in the hospital system and the way people sometimes engage um, with, with the patients and their families where there were themes that came through that they felt that their loved one was almost considered like a sack of body parts and that people were sacrificing a piece of death in the experience of making organ donation decisions. So this is pretty powerful stuff for me. And um, it, it deeply influenced me. And um, I then was spending time at Regnet, the um, Regulatory Institutions Network at the ANU, which is where I had the wonderful privilege of meeting Professor Valerie Braithwaite and Professor John Braithwaite and, and Jennifer Llewellyn. And it's there that I started to learn about um, restorative justice and restorative practices and, um, and started to think about how maybe this could apply in the hospital setting to the families that were going through this absolute chaos, trying to work out a, a, a way through to have a good outcome for the, or the best outcome they could manage for themselves and their families. So this was a, di a difficult um, thing to be managing and trying to work out, well, we know the system is what the system is. So how do we change the system? How do we make it 
um, safer for families and and how does it become more responsive to the people who are going through those crisis events? And we're looking at the, the where trust set and where hope set and where that idea of deep hope, which is a palliative care concept um, about that idea of hope beyond death, of, of being able to envisage something beyond what you can conceive as your lifetime. Those are really important factor, thing, things that emerged as, as families tried to come to decisions that were right for them and their families. And much of that, that decision making evolved around placing that meaning for what was going to happen next in their life to get it right. And many of them were very fearful about having memories that, that, that um, would include guilt for not easing the suffering of their loved one. So, this is where the restorative justice um, ideas started to really take seed. There were families, one family had had a relative who died in the hospital because they'd suicided in the hospital and under the care of the mental health team. That family was devastated by the way that their care was provided. Um, there are other families who had really great experiences, were filled with trust, were filled with hope because they knew that everybody had done everything they possibly could for them. So going on to um, from that area, and I'll just give you a little example of what, a statement from one of the families that sort of captures um, the pain and the suffering, which can be there, but we, as health professionals, we don't even recognise because we're so caught up in the moment of doing our job. So but in this particular um, quote, it was one of the patient's um, mothers who was in the middle of the night, but this time of night in, in Australia, um, in the intensive care unit and she was watching the monitor and sitting with the loved one and the doctor arrived um, this intensive care specialist he didn't even say hello when he came in the room he just went to testing and by testing she was talking about brain death testing it's almost like it becomes not a person anymore it's not my daughter it's not someone's loved one but it's a patient they're attending to when I said to him about her high blood pressure he just said, and I don't think he even turned around, something like, she'll be dead in a day or two. And I just burst into tears. He explained why then and apologised, but he could have handled that nicer. And then another mother talking about, about suddenly having that realisation that she'd agreed um, on forms that her son could be an organ donor. And she told her son, tick the box. You can, you know, we, we'll all become organ donors when we die. We won't need them anymore. And they had the big family lunch and everybody ticked the box and filled out the forms. All of a sudden, she was in a situation where she knew her son wasn't going to survive. She knew that she'd signed paperwork to say he was going to be an organ donor. And she suddenly thought, oh, my goodness, they're going to take his eyes. And she hadn't thought about that. It was not something that even it crossed her mind until the point when she suddenly realised this was all happening and she had no idea how the process worked, what was going to happen next or how she'd manage it. So these are real life examples of, of what it's like to be a family member in the hospital in, in, um, situation, in the hospital environment. And it's often these stories are things that we don't hear generally as nurses working within the system and doctors working within the system. But these are the experiences that families have. And these are areas where I believe that using restorative approaches, we can start to change the way we deliver care. So schools, hospitals and prisons are driven uh, well, much the same kind of processes. They're authoritarian, there's your dress code, emphasis on silence and order. You've got to walk in line, you've got to fit in, or you lose your individual autonomy. There's a power loss. There's always a power loss. There's a bridge of freedoms. The power belongs with the people who are running the institutions. It doesn't sit with the people who are in need of the institutions. And this is a really important part of the work that we're doing. So there are cultures of fear within these institutions, between, particularly in the healthcare setting. We know that people are fearful of speaking up if they're a patient or a, or a, or a family member. The fear they don't want to get the staff offside because that might not be good for the care of their loved one. They want to fit in. And for the staff, they're fearful that they're going to do something wrong. They're fearful that, you know, if they do something wrong, what's going to happen to them? So there's a lot of processes now being implemented around 
um, Sentinel events to try to, to make it easier for people to divulge when they've made a mistake so that the, that mistake can be mitigated against and, and care corrected. So these are all areas where there are restorative practices currently taking place on, and that there is a huge potential to do this better. So the work that I look at and think about and, and, and plan and plot around is that idea of that deep hope that I've mentioned previously, that hope that is durable and it often thrives even in the face of imminent death because we see that hope. Well, I, be I believe I saw it in the data and in the experiences of the families who are making organ donation decisions at the end of life. But I've also seen this hope um, with the, some of the amazing elders that I work with who um, have gone through extraordinary trauma in their lifetimes. But, um, and I've heard stories which have broken my heart and brought it back together again because I've seen how they've managed to recreate and to grow and to have extraordinary graciousness in the face of, of having had suffering, to have formed an idea of something that's better. And this has helped to give them not resiliency, it's far beyond resiliency, it's, it's a way of moving forward, which is incredibly productive to our, for our society. So this is where I became linked into the Canberra Restorative Community, wonderful community and, um, and a very powerful group of, of amazing people who are helping to, to do good work. Um, and that community is linked in um, with the international learn, uh, commu uh, learning community by using the principles of restorative justice to underpin relational practice in all areas of governance to improve community well-being. So, this, so the work that I'm involved in is about healing difficult healthcare relationships and improving relationship cultures for health professionals that impact on clinical practice and the patients and the community and staff and the well-being of basically all of us. Because each one of us, we are in relationships. So if we happen to be the nurse who's caring for the patient and the family and things aren't going well, we, we do sometimes carry that home. It's not good if we don't get that healthcare relationship right. There is regret, there is burnout, and there is moral dissonance after a period of time. So this research that we're involved in brings together four lots of <laughs> bodies of previously underconnected research the idea of workplace bullying in hospitals, preventable medical harms in hospitals, and restorative practices for dealing with conflict and harm applied to most vulnerable voices in those systems. What I've learned working with our Indigenous colleagues is that Indigenous research approaches reveal strengths that uncover new ways to engage in healthcare relationships. By using decolonizing approaches, really unpacking who you are and what helps to inform the way you are and you behave and you interact with your institutions um, is really a great space for, um, for work, seeking out where restorative justice resides and the restorative practice can really start to alleviate some of the harm. So my, I propose in, 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 our, in our talk today that we can actually use restorative practice to anticipate and prevent harms. And, and that this, is the, this is the hope that I have for the work that we're involved in, that we can actually, rather than being um, always jumping in and trying to solve a problem when it's, it develops, is we can actually anticipate it because we can hear the voices early to know what, what something is coming, that we can have those conversations to mitigate the harm before it becomes a problem. And that way we can build just principled relationships of trust and deep hope for silenced, excluded and disempowered populations. We have conversations. It's about listening and learning. So there's plenty of evidence out there about problems, uh, problems in relationships, problems about not listening sufficiently to patients and staff, not hearing what's actually happening within an institution. They're, they're, and obviously there are huge social costs associated with that, human costs, but also financial costs. And, and I know our health systems at the moment are, are all struggling under the costs of everything, including COVID. Um, but but I, 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 I suggest that we could be, if we get our, our personal relationships right within the healthcare system, we could be saving an awful lot of money. And this is work that was undertaken in New Zealand. 
We know in Australia the impact of racial discrimination is, is, is causing, um, it's contributing to the gap in equity of social outcomes and health outcomes. We see this in children, we see it in adults. This is very recent research which has just been published um, from the Australian National University. Um, huge, um, huge data set, eight, over 8,000 participants. And it really showed um, how discrimination and racism was impacting the health and well-being of many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And that um, this was actually happening in the healthcare system predominantly. So um, certainly in Australia, we've got a lot to do to learn about our history. It's, it has been silenced, um, it's been hidden. Um, people of my generation who were never taught our real history and part of the work that I do as an ed nurse educator is to teach about the real history of, um, of Australia and um, the invasion uh, because it actually was an invasion and that's not what we've been taught but that's actually what happened there, there were many um, many battles and it wasn't done peacefully and it's never been ceded. So this lack of recognition of dispossession is actually part of the major problem that's happening in the, for the Indigenous community at the moment as they struggle. There is no voice to Parliament, there is no treaty, there is no recognition um, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were here um, previously. So this is a local problem in, this, in Canberra. This is something that really affects our local population. Um, Australian um, Aboriginal people are amongst the most incarcerated in the world. And locally, um, Aboriginal mothers are 16.3 times uh, more likely to have their child removed and put in out of home care than a non-Indigenous woman. Um, their children are likely to end up in um, being incarcerated by the time they're 10 years of age. It's um, minimum age of incarceration at the moment. And, um, and they'll often end up in, um, in, the, in, in institutional care and suicide early or have mental health problems and die from other causes. So this is a sad history. Um, and locally, we, we can't walk past those statistics that, what, that contribute to the gap because as, as um, healthcare professionals, if we don't see, if we don't hear and we don't act, then we're part of the problem. So the truth telling is important, and um, and that's why you know I'm bringing this to your attention because it, 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 we do have to say this because until we can actually admit to it and start to start to work on the healing, we can't have uh, principled relationships. We can't have just relationships. We have to be honest. So this is Australia. This is all of our nations in Australia. Um, I, I, I'm actually just down here, tucked away in Ngunnawal country. And um, as you can see, there are about 500 nations prior to invasion. So restorative ju justice, restorative practice, the way that we're using it in our work and the way we understand it, it's a philosophy in action. It replaces respect for relationships at the heart of every interaction. It's a relational approach founded in the beliefs about the equality dignity and potential of all people and about just structures and systems that enable people to thrive and succeed together. This is a definition that's used by Wanganui District um, Health Board and by the Wanganui District Hospital. And this is the hospital that um, my co colleagues and I went to see to learn from uh, about how we could do a restorative hospital at, in Canberra. Now, just to explain a little bit more about Australia and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the more that I learn, the more that I think, oh my goodness, this is extraordinary. This is so important and we should all be learning about this. The definition of health according to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and this is a consensus agreement that was made um, back in about 1989, there was a lot of work done to come up with this definition from vo the voices of the people who knew. But health is not just about the physical well-being of the individual, but the social, emotional and cultural well-being of the whole community. And this is a whole of life view. And it also includes the cyclical concept of life, death, life. So they don't they see that when you, if you, an individual is, is, is unwell, 
the whole community is unwell. If the community is well, the individual will flourish. So everybody's connected and it's not just a moment in time. It's not an interlude of somebody gets tonsillitis and, and then they recover. Health is about all of life and it's, and it's spiritual and it's connected to country and it's connected to um, the, inter the generations. It's who comes ahead of you and who comes behind. So we've, we've had lots of problems, as I've just explained to you, since decolonization about separations and all of those things, and this is across the life cycle. So what we look to see now is, well, what is a flourishing community? How can we achieve it and how are we going to do this? We've got to find out how to get that deep hope out there. And what is it that the Indigenous community is seeing which helps them to grow and to to, to to aim for a future. And, and that's what I've found has been quite remarkable in the relationships that we've developed with the Indigenous elders that I'm working with. So there are a lot of knowledges there, um, surprising things which I didn't know. For instance, the early colonisers would go to the um, Aboriginal midwives and not to the colonisers' mid midwives because they knew the babies and the, mother, and the women were much more likely to survive with an Indigenous midwife. And discovered that the life expectancy of First Nations Australians was um, considerably higher than um, Europeans at the time when, of colonisation. Um, lots of amazing things that we've learned. So, um, and ways of learning and thinking and ways of thinking. So the, the approach that we're using is to really look at, you know, trying to think about how, how do we decolonise? How am I decolonising myself as I do this work and I'm working with others? And so learning from people like Elizabeth Carlson and many others, it, you see that there is a power to, to change the social contract between non-Indigenous and Indigenous peoples. And in Australia, I would say that, you know, this is really incredibly important and, and to earn trust so that we can actually engage in strong reciprocal relationships. So it's those, all those questions, why do you do what you do? What's the purpose? How do you do what you do? And what the hell do you do? We, we decided the best way to go, do it is to learn more from our restorative community, which is why we went to Wanganui. And they place uh, Fano or family at the centre of the service delivery, and uh, a really transformational approach of, of of managing a situation which was really tricky, not like unlike one that we had in Canberra. They had a health service which was under a lot of fire from the from the media, from the community, um, from within the health service. It was costing a lot of money, high staff turnover, things were difficult. And they ended up, they had a, a major inquiry. And from the inquiry, the direction came through that they would use restorative justice approaches and transform the way they delivered, they, they ran the institution and they delivered care. And it would be guided and supported by the Maori elders. So in Canberra, we thought, oh, that sounds amazing. We'd better go over and learn about it because we were building a new hospital on our campus and we could imagine, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could have a restorative hospital where we'd have human flourishing with compassion and advocacy for truth, dignity and respect centred on the most vulnerable to empower relational healing and healthcare achieved by giving voice to the vulnerable and embedding restorative practice of every bit of our nursing and midwifery, teaching, learning and research. So that was a dream. This dream hasn't faded. We've still got the dream. <laughs> so we headed off and I, I haven't got very much time, so I'll just quickly flick through a couple of these slides. But we were focusing on those, the idea of cultural safety. Um, amazing work by Irupati Ramsden in New Zealand in 2002 with her PhD looked and, uh, and unpacked cultural safety and looked through the lens of nursing. And it was really powerful work that helped helps us today in Australia, to, um, particularly in our relational work, to see what cultural safety really is. And it's about understanding uh, how, if, if a person is feeling safe through the, through the um, experience of a recipient of the care. So if the person tells you, I don't feel safe, then you know that they know what they're talking about that they need to be able to feel safe enough to tell you that they don't feel safe. But, so that's where the nub comes. So that work has um, 
has been important. So our team, who's brilliant, Andy Rosalind Brown and many others, Rowena Cooey, Ned, um, Wayne, Mary, Mark, Tracy, and many others, have helped us to look at introducing restorative health practices to give voice accountability and healing value for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families and communities at New Public Hospital. We saw it was important to go first to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families because we'd worked out that they were the most vulnerable people in Canberra. It was pretty obvious you go to a population that's most at risk and you go, okay, if we can help you, everybody will benefit. So that logic has followed through and we can continue on that. So the journey was great. It was culture leading practice. So we were advised by Auntie Rose that if we're going to Wanganui, we take gifts. We bring cultural gifts of thanks. So a beautiful artwork created by um, Lenise, which we took with us. And the artwork depicts two sisters. And it's the idea of a sister hospital relationship and the two sisters are, 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 are joyful together. They sometimes rub up against each other, but they continue in their strong relationship. Our team was very excited and we headed off. That's Auntie Roz, Wayne and Mark. And um, when we arrived there, we were very, even more excited. And then we started to learn. And we learned and we learned and we learned. We had extraordinary privilege. It was a deeply cultural um, and personal connections. We learned things about ourselves that we'd never known before. And one of the things that was extraordinary from me was to see the respect that was shown to my colleagues who were First Nations. And I was it was such a joyful event because of that deep respect, which tragically was very hard to see in Australia for, for my colleagues. So we were invited to the Marae and um, we had such respect for our elders. Um, we wish we wish had sharing about the sacred river, the Wanganui River, which is a living entity. And we learned about mana and so much more. So these are just a few photos of the, the journey. Um, it was quite remarkable and we were so fortunate. And we got taught to row together in a waka. This is a waka. And we're taught that if you share your values and you co-create your values, you can work together to get to the other side. But if you don't all work together, you'll never reach the end of your journey. So those are the things that are core to a restorative hospital and core to the relationships that we have when we engage with, with our community. And their view is a, a far no family focus. The health of an individual is only as good as the health of their whole family. And the patient safety approach needs to be patient-centered family care. It's saying they have no existing hours, come whenever you go, some sleep over. It's seeing the family as one. So these are classic um, things that fit perfectly with our Aboriginal definition of health. And we thought, oh, this is looking really good. And um, so that idea was scattered throughout the hospital that um, the family-centred care is what's really important. So if you come to the emergency department, rather than what you'll have in our local emergency department usually, but we're changing that, is um, what, what's wrong with you? You get instead, how can I help you and your family? And that changes the whole dynamic. So it's about the ideas of leading the, our culture and um, values leading practice and about choosing staff um, who fit the values and the practice of that community. So, so that, but I, Jen, how am I going? Have I got much time left? <laughs> I don't yeah. want to- Yep, yeah, you have about five minutes. We've got five minutes, okay. I, I just wanted to take, through, take you through just a couple of these things on this slide. And it's about personal responsibilities that we've discovered that need to be part of that restorative re approach um, when you're caring for families and you're caring for community. And they're decolonizing anti-racist approaches. So you have to be really, it's about being really critical and really rigorous in self-assessment. And this becomes part of seeing yourself as, as a therapeutic tool. So into, when induction into the community, it's rec being recognised and respecting the difference. We're all different. 
that we're, that we're equals. And it's about responsibility of, of, of fitting in with the community and understanding the well-being, knowing that each is different, but each has a unique role and we're all accountable to work together to achieve their goals. But the idea of cultural humility, about knowing to, what you don't know, you say you don't know, and about, and about trying to really remove that arrogance and the paternalism that is sometimes deeply embedded in our practices without us even realising. Being responsible to respectfully acknowledge every person every time, regardless of their social status. So in Wanganui, it was about teaching the emergency consultant that it's absolutely the appropriate thing to say, good morning in Maori to the cleaner as you walk past. And how are you going and how is your family? We are all working together for the same purpose. Thinking of the other without assumptions or, or judgments and having empathy, how can I help you and your family? And listening, really listening to understand what's most important to that person and their family. So for instance, it might be that they don't want to come to the hospital because they're worried about the, the, the animal that's at home, their pet dog or their pet cat that might need feeding. And they don't know what's going to happen to that animal, so they refuse to come. So these are all the important questions which are really important to the person. So the homawana are the trusted, deeply knowledgeable and navigators. They move between the community and the hospital. And these people are extraordinary because they become the connectors the patients and their families and um, a really important part of that process. And they also fit it, it all fits in with the social determinants and thinking of needs. So is the healthcare accessible? Is it transport, is food, medications, housing, literacy, rehab, recovery? So it's the whole social package. So our healing restorative work is responding to what's most important to that person and their family. And that is a different question to what we usually ask. So the work that's been done there is going really well. So they, they, they started by saying, um, when, and one of the, this is a physician who came from somewhere else. When, when I saw when I came there was a broken process. It wasn't about that patients and their families and we were on the front page of paper. Families would go on a journey with us. It was their loved one of themselves had been harmed. And they got everybody to come on that journey. And it was a, a proactive approach to restorative justice. And it became a place where people wanted to work. So that model is around, if you can, you have a treaty. If it's, even if it's flawed, it's better than none. It's about decolonization, about being anti-racist. And it's about connecting to country, to elders, to the spirit, and being really showing visible signs of safety for people, safe language, safe spaces. In uh, Wanganui, the idea of water was really helpful. There are many environments, and I think I'm just about out of time, so I'm going to move through these last ones very quickly to say that the community is always really important, um, that, that the sharing of information, sharing of knowledge and culture, this is um, Professor Deep Saini, our ex-Vice-Chancellor, um, being presented, presenting the waka between the two of them to Auntie Agnes O'Shea and my senior Ngunnawal elder. This was a, the, the gift that was given to us from Wanganui to bring home to say, you all have to ride together to keep a focus on the, on the goal, which is um, to have a thriving community. So what we apply, we've learned is we apply to our relationships, our work, our teaching, and, and we keep learning some more. And um, we did have our blessing of our, our Canberra Hospital, of our University of Canberra Hospital. It was blessed by the elders before it was opened. It has culturally safe um, places to go. It has beautiful artwork, and it has staff who are, who are getting there. We've still got work to do, but are starting to really understand that restorative approach. So as Auntie Agnes would say, in the spirit of reconciliation, we welcome you to Ngunnawal country. May the spirit of our ancestors embrace you and care for you throughout your healing journey. In the words of the Ngunnawal people, Nuna Yingo, which means you may leave your footprints on our land. And those are the wishes from our community for healing for everyone else. And I will finish off there, <laughs> which is... Done. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Holly. And look at that. Even at 2 a.m., you can manage to uh, to come in on, on the dot. Uh, so it's one o'clock here and we have, an, we have about 20 minutes um, to be able to talk, uh, offer some of the questions up uh, to you. Uh, wishing that this this format allowed us to do that in person, but I'll I'll do my best to uh, to animate some of those questions just to let those of you who are um, listening know um, there are some folks in a, in a classroom and some uh, uh, great many of you online. Uh, so if you go down to the question and answer box, I'm happy to um, to take those questions. I wanted to ask one of clarification that came really early. Um, uh, just so that uh, so that I'm right in the definition I may have offered in the in the chat, Holly. Someone asked uh, from your initial slide where we were talking about the sort of places and spaces that this might be applicable. What a Lazarus uh, is? Yeah, the these were the quarantine. Actually, I'm just looking here. It, but it wasn't the maritime travellers. They you they they actually would claim that they were for people with uh, syphilis and various other STDs and things like that and they'd take them and place them in these remote locations on islands and various places around the country um, and unfortunately when they went back and they did their um, and looked at the history they discovered that many of the people who'd been incarcerated in these medical institutions um, actually were, were never diagnosed with a problem. So one of the other questions that's come in, Holly, um, is whether or not you think it's important for nursing schools and medical schools uh, more broadly to have more diverse student bodies, specifically targeting Indigenous students. And I want to combine that question with inviting you to say a little bit more, because I, I do know from your research um, that you've tried to think about how that might show up in the new hospital and in the nursing school in terms of not only um, how it might encourage greater diversity in the student body. So answer that question first, but then how it is that you create a place and space for uh, students to be able to be um, more inclusive, more welcoming within the body. So I'm thinking particularly about some of the work uh, to build that capacity for cultural safety through yearning circles. So I wanted to invite you to answer the, do you think, um, uh, do you think that uh, that there should be more diverse student bodies? How is that important to a restorative hospital to flourishing in healthcare? And then maybe giving them a bit of a, a sense of some yeah. of that work that you've done. No, look, that's really great. Um, it, it's it's critical to have a student voices, and one of the biggest problems are, uh, on, on the number of committees where we're trying to increase the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students within um, nursing and midwifery, and uh, particularly through to completion. Um, I'm really excited. One of our students who's been, who um, is a Wiradjuri woman, um, she's, she's remarkable. She's now president of our nurses society here at the university. But we have set up a, a, a bit of a research um, project, which we're struggling with a little bit, I'll be perfectly honest. It's a, called, it's a community of practice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. And I think we're probably a bit too heavyweight with academics. <laughs> and I think, um, I think we probably need to step right back and allow the students to do what the students want to do. But of course, it's been complicated by COVID. Um, at the moment, our students aren't allowed on campus. And um, we've been trying to run this work over the last um, few months. And um, it, although we've gone to Zoom meetings, they're not highly attended. But, but then again, it, it goes back to those ideas of, of cultural safety and, and making it so. And in fact, I've just finished writing something today about the, one of the metrics to measure cultural safety, um, particularly within our, within our universities, I think should be the number of students who are actually willing to divulge that they are um, First Nations. Um, for, for in Australia, there were um, policies around, around assimilation, assimilation and actually genocide, which were designed to um, effectively breed out, this sounds horrible, but this is what it was, to breed out the Aboriginality from the, the community so that, that and anybody that was fair skin, they would be whipped away, taken away and put in an institution. 
Um, they wouldn't be allowed to speak language, their, cult, their um, identity would effectively be removed. Auntie Ros, who's um, um, an elder in residence at the university, is one of those, those people who went through that process. And, um, and so, so many of our students who are within the school don't know that they're actually Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students within the school body. And, um, and so, you know, we know at the moment that we have 22 that identify, but, um, and by identify, it means it's on their university record, but they might not necessarily feel comfortable about telling people because they're fearful of racism. And they're fearful of being said, oh, you, you can't be Aboriginal because you don't look at Aboriginal. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's trying to bring us to a space where we can make that safe. So within our teaching of Indigenous health, um, we, we try to make that lovely safe space so that our First Nations students can, can feel comfortable to say, well, actually, I am Aboriginal and this is my story. And, and, and um, we've been very excited over the last um, few years that the, right, the number of uh, students who are happy to divulge seems to be going up and up and up. So the more that that happens, then the more that they'll be happy to get together in groups and, and form associations. And, 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 but it, it's, it's a, a painfully slow process. I hope that helps to answer that question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I find important and compelling around, um, around thinking about how it is that we don't simply increase numbers, but we ensure that we are increasing the capacity for uh, belonging and for um, engagement and for um, uh, genuineness of, of participation. And so those two things, one would think are, are directly related. I, I, um, I do know, and, and Brenda Morrison has asked in the, in the question box to, to um, invite you to, to tell us a bit about the concept of deep listening and how this concept is introduced to healthcare professionals. Yeah. And, and she's thinking here too, along as the lines of wanting to hear a bit about the yarning circles a work that you've used to build community, to build that uh, place of cultural safety and of knowledge of cultural traditions as part of capacity building and learning for students. I wonder if you might um, tell us a bit about that. Thanks so much, Brenda, for that question. Look, it's it's really uh, the idea of Dadiri, the deep listening, is absolutely beautiful. And um, I'm happy to, you know, I'll send, can send a link through. Um, um, Auntie Miriam Rose Ungemeyer, who is um, a elder from the Northern Territory, from uh, ha has gifted it to the Australian people as a concept. And it's it's a concept which is about you're listening, listening for the seasons, you're listening for the changes, you're listening to the earth, you're listening deeply and, and you wait and you wait and you wait till you hit to the time is right. And, and it is absolutely gorgeous. There's a beautiful video clip that goes with it, which um, I'll send as well. Uh, but the idea, and she, her view is that as a gift to all Australians, that this is what will help us to transform our country and to take it um, to where we need to be um, through through this healing process that we need to go through, uh, and so it's a most it, it is a beautiful concept. So we bring that to the students in yarning circles. So we start um, in our classes, with, and it's a first year unit teaching Indigenous health, which see it's really critical and important unit, um, and and we start by by playing the, the, the segment on the dairy. And and bring and bring them having them in the yarning circle before that starts. So that in the yarning circle, the idea is we sit in a circle. All the all the devices are switched off, put away, and, and not, not available to to play with. There's no desk in front, so that your body is you you have a, a full body language is exposed to each other. Each of us can see the other person, and we're all equal. Everybody, everybody is equal in the room. It's led by an Indigenous elder and supported by a non-Indigenous staff member and who effectively works to make sure that the safety of, of, the, of the circle is kept. And that if somebody is struggling, that there's, some, there's somebody on the lookout to, to keep that safe. And um, we st start with an um, acknowledgement of country and respect, a cultural respect is shown. 
and then um, the, the, the person goes, the, the yarn goes around the circle. So everybody has a time to speak without interruption and, um, and knowledge is created and shared. And it's, we find it's phenomenal for the students and particularly, um, strangely enough, our international students because they feel much safer, um, even with English as a second language, to be able to speak up in that setting and to, and to be respected. And the first couple of times, it's, it's a little hard for them, but they, get, they indicate that they really love it and the feedback's fantastic. So we love our yarning circles and, um, and they're taking off like there's no tomorrow. And if I had my way, I'd completely redesign the university so that we didn't have desks everywhere anymore. We'd have beautiful circle rooms with, so that you could come in and sit down and yarn. <laughs> it's fascinating uh, to see it both from the perspective of how is it that you create safe spaces for people to learn and educate, but I'm, I'm thinking about the part of your presentation that was calling people in to, to work in different ways as healthcare teams and, and centering within the team of healthcare, those who are receiving care, right? That changing that question from what's wrong with you to how can we help as, as part of the team. And so I, I immediately think about the kind of skills that, that that might be providing people to have different kinds of conversations and actually work as teams in different ways. So fascinating. I, uh, there's a question from Marika Warren that, um, and that I think uh, helps us kind of think about this relational capacity that's that's been built in this restorative approach and the extent to which you've seen it be able to make a difference or is making a difference since you're still in the full throes of, of COVID and how COVID was managed in hospitals compared to other facilities. Did this, did this show up? Did the strength of some of these relationships and the work you've been doing show up in that period of time? Is it providing some kind of a uh, a, a basis or a direction in terms of how you uh, did respond or, or might be responding? So from, Look, that's um, a really great question, Jen. Um, and it's, and it's a trick, uh, it's, I mean, it's almost impossible to know, you really don't know, but I am part of a, a research project at the moment where, where, where uh, we've spoken to quite a few nurses who've been part of the COVID response and uh, analyzing the feedback. Um, it, 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 it's not spoken of, um, and particularly from from the, the, the university hospital. It's not spoken of overtly, but the behaviours and the practices are very much more, are very much more restoratively approach. And the way they, that the talking about the families, talking about trying, you know, the the, the the suffering that people go through when they're excluded from coming to see their loved one, and the efforts that they've gone to to be able to bring families together with their dying relative, despite the, the barriers to access. Um, and there's, there's a lot in there and you go, oh, that's really, it's really positive. In, it, it, it's, it's, it's not the, the old fashioned punitive approach of, no, no, you're not allowed in, no, no, this is the way of our rules are, this is how we're going to do it. it was mu it's much more relationally um, responsive. And, and, but I, I, there's no way I could make any generalizations on it. <laughs> It, it will be interesting to have those kinds of conversations because I think Marika's question raises this, you know, um, both whether or not having taken that more restorative approach at the building of the hospital and the, and the preparation of nursing, they might have been better prepared for the complexities of COVID and those relationships that kind of looking at a lens that requires much attention to their teams, but also to the sort of public health sphere. But I, it'll be really interesting to see if that the lessons of COVID actually reinforce um, the importance of the work that you're doing, right? The need for a different kind of approach to healthcare, both within teams. I wonder if you have any insights about um, whether you think there will be an opportunity in our recovery and in our lessons post-COVID. Um, I wonder if that resonates for you. I think so. I, I, I think there's enormous opportunities, actually, and I think that um, COVID has created a um, such such a disruption in in everything, um, in the way we see our relationships with other people, in the way we interact um, with technology, with the, with um, with our absences from from contact with people, and I think in the healthcare sector, um, some of it I've been amazed and 
delighted by some of the senior leadership within Canberra's um, health service and their approaches to suggestions around restorative approaches. And, and it's been, you know, you sort of think, wow, where did that come from? It's really nice stuff where you sort of think that people are really thinking. I think it's, it, yeah, I think they're thinking differently and they're starting to think differently. And, um, and it's really exciting from, and you, I can see a change for whatever reason. It has certainly been a change over the last five years. It's, it's different. But I, I can't, you know, we can't claim all of the all of the, <laughs> the glory for that. But it's that there are ideas which are certainly permeating and starting to to create, um, I think, a much more positive approach. So uh, one of um, Professor Sheila Wildman uh, here at the Sheila School of Law is posing a question, and she um, uh, works in the space and place of, of uh, mental health care, and particularly with a, a care of centering those um, who their first voice and first experience. And, and so she's asked, do you have examples of special challenges or techniques where this approach has been applied um, in terms of both cross-cultural and intersectional uh, mental health care um, and how that, uh, how that might be being either approached or, um, or centered in the work mm -hmm. that you do? Look, that, uh, that's, uh, that's an area which is a huge challenge for us locally. And in fact, I've been connecting with Michael Power, who's up in Queensland, um, a bit further north, and he um, is involved in working on the forensic mental health program there. For our Indigenous community, um, the mental health problems are enormous, and and I think that um, that at the university, you know, the discussions that we have around that are, um, yeah, you can see that this is where we need to go, but but we're nowhere near it. In Wanganui, um, one of the, our team members is a mental health nurse and she was chosen specifically because she's a mental health nurse and with a lot of experience um, working in Indigenous communities. And they, they, some of the findings from, from Wanganui were great around, it, 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 we'll put it this way, when Tracy and, um, and Wayne walked into the forensic unit um, and they were both experienced into walking into forensic units they were both gobsmacked. They, they just couldn't believe the freedoms, the way, the way the care was delivered. And a lot of the work that had been done there had been because the administration had changed their approach to how the unit was run by going to the, the staff who worked there all the time and saying to them, what do you think would work here well? Because they've been having problems with over, you know, use, overuse of restraints, they've had violence, they've had all sorts of other issues going on. And the staff were given the opportunity to create their perfect world and to say, well, I'd like to do this and we could do this and we could do this. And they got to actually use their knowledge, use their experience to say these things would make a difference. So once it was clarified as to what the problems were and what they needed to address, the, the team were able to find their own solutions. And that seemed to be a particularly powerful restor restorative approach. And Holly, do you think, I'm gonna ask the follow-up question that I'm gonna assume is in Sheila's mind is, um, is that you know clearly is important to have a more diverse um, view of those who are providing frontline care and and actually may know what helps rather than sort of top down. But to what extent then might a restorative approach is next step or part of this be to find ways and what might the challenges be in those ways of actually hearing the voice of those who are receiving that care and who are uh, uh, need to be empowered to be able to uh, participate fully in that those insights and those decisions around uh, their own care and their own needs. Mm -hmm. Is that, um, do you think that's part of what the, the sort of a uh, shift is? Do you, do you see that as more challenging um, in the context of mental health? Because I know that's certainly what the shift is for, for example, in natal care and, mm -hmm. um, and, and other healthcare. So I'm wondering your thoughts about, about where that is now and where it might go. Well, I think from, from, from this work, it was very, it, there, that was one of the critical things. And when um, what, what the District Health Board did, which 
um, were very, again, we thought was outstanding, is they would take every month when they had their meetings, so, um, the executive meetings, rather than having a paper, a, a paper presenting all of the complaints and the issues and, and the things that have been going on, they'd actually be presented with a person telling them about their situation and what, what the problem had been. So they're actually going face to face with the community um, to hear firsthand what the story was and to come to some agreement as to what they could do to make it a bit better. Um, and on top of that, and, and so, you know, I almost fell off my chair when I found out they were publishing in the local newspaper all of the statistics of how many complaints they'd received, how many compliments they'd received, what the complaints were and what they were doing about it. And I thought, oh, well, that's transparent. <laughs> so so I, I think, you know, those, those ideas of transparency, of, of, of um, you know, certainly with the organ donation work I do, one of the biggest challenges for our donor families here in Australia um, is um, what, very often, like our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community, often silenced and often... Um, for basically put away, you know, you've made a donation decision, we'll go away, thank you, we've, we've got what we need now, which is, I mean, it's a wonderful decision and I fully support organ donation, but I also fully support a bit of reciprocity and acknowledgement for donor families. And one of the themes that came through in a major national inquiry into organ donation a couple of years ago was the fact that there is no complaints number, there is no ability to put in a complaint anywhere. <laughs> And, um, and so when the, the national organisation was saying we get no complaints, it was made very clear that the reason why you get no complaints is there is no ability to provide, to make a complaint. That's <laughs> so, a good strategy if you don't want complaints. That's There's right. No <laughs> so, so those are processes and institutions, you know, if you're, if you're doing a top-down, bottom-up look, you go, where is the complaints process? Is it access accessible? Does somebody actually check it or do they put it in the rubbish bin? Um, what's the feedback loop? So we presented to government a lovely new feedback loop on what they could do with their, you know, this is how a complaint could go. It could be managed. It could be then you could talk, come back to a person who's put the complaint to see that you're actually listening to them. <laughs> so, That's great. Well, Holly, I think... <laughs> we are um, we are at that time when uh, when we have to um, allow people to go back to their day, and I'm hoping allow you to perhaps go back to sleep or get an extremely early start uh, on your day. I did want to clarify. Brenda has just asked uh, as one final question. She was just trying to clarify if your reference was to uh, Dr. Michael Parle. Is that who you meant in Queensland? Yeah, I'll yep. um, I'll connect you. Yep. Great. Yep. Perfect. So I want to thank you uh, so much for being with us. And, uh, and I really do hope this is a chance sort of to introduce you to the very thriving uh, community of students and, uh, and researchers and scholars and practitioners in healthcare uh, here in, uh, in Halifax and in Nova Scotia. We're so fortunate to have this seminar series as a, as a place and space that that community gets to connect and gather. It's, it's usually over um, some sandwiches and some chance to see each other spaces so we're hoping that the world allows that to be true again soon but I know that you're really uh, interested and excited to have people um, connect with you especially during the period of your fellowship here where you're where you're really hoping to have the chance to uh, to connect and learn along so I'd encourage people uh, to be in touch with you they can they can find uh, your email through the uh, through the University of Canberra um, and uh, and to thank all of you there were um, a, a a group of people in a classroom watching and and uh, another 40 or so online at the at the uh, height of the presentation so a great community of people um, many thanks to all of you for joining us and we hope you'll join for the next uh, health law seminar on october 29th uh, for ingrid waldron and uh, and thanks very much holly thank you so much <laughs> bye everyone <laughs>